But Lars, let's start with you and sort of thinking about this moment for Novo Nordisk. You're a 100-year-old company uh, with, of course, your roots in diabetes. And now we're at this moment when you have this new class of medicines for both diabetes and obesity that many are calling a potential revolution in the way we uh, treat these conditions. Maybe just talk about this moment uh, with your drugs Ozempic and Wagovi and what you see the impact of them and future medicines uh, really having on these diseases. Yeah, good morning, uh, morning uh, Meg. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this is a truly amazing uh, period in the history of, of Novo Nordisk, and I would also say for people living with both diabetes and obesity. As you know, we have a 100-year legacy in, uh, in uh, insulins, uh, and during the last couple of decades, we have uh, researched a lot into the, a new category called GLP-1s uh, that was first tested out in uh, type 2 diabetes. And... Uh, during that process, we, uh, we realized that it had a quite broad biological mechanism that also lent itself uh, for being tested out in, uh, in obesity. And we're now seeing for the first time really efficacious anti-obesity medicines that uh, are really meeting the expectations of both physicians and patients in terms of weight loss. And as obesity is a leading cause of type 2 diabetes and a number of other diseases, you can say that we're actually going to prevent one of the diseases we have been living uh, uh, from, from from many years. And uh, the fact that alone in the U.S. there are at least three times as many people living with obesity compared to people living with, with diabetes, this is a significant opportunity for improving health of the individual, uh, increasing health resilience, taking burden off healthcare systems, and obviously also an opportunity for a company like Nord Nordisk so we're really excited about what we see in the market and, and what we're bringing to patients uh, these days. Mm. And Cotton, maybe walk us through some of the science uh, behind these medicines. This class of drugs, people feel like they kind of came out of nowhere, but they really didn't, right? I mean, there were earlier iterations of drugs in this class, and they've sort of gotten better over time. Maybe explain the science behind them. How do they work? And why is this latest group in this class having such an impact? Yes, thank you, Megan. But maybe if you allow me, let's just take a step back and then just have a brief recap as to what are the drivers of obesity, right? at least as what we understand today. And it's important to say that obesity is, in very simple terms, a combination of what uh, energy that you intake and then the energy that you use. Right? So it's that balance that is quite important to have it in good, in good shape. Now, it's also important to remind us that about 70 percent of the population that lives with obesity has a genetic component that is driving the disease, but also an environmental factor. Right? So if we can come back to the balance of energy in and energy out, this is where this mechanism of the GLP-1 plays a role. Now, the control of energy intake is actually a very complex system that is mainly modulated in the brain. And now we have more understanding as to what are the areas of the brain that are actually playing a role here. So the GLP-1 that is secreted from the intestine signals through the brain in specific areas that actually control how much hunger we have, but also how full we feel after we have a meal. And in individuals that maybe are suffering more with obesity, there is a dysregulation in this uh, level of uh, proteins or peptides. And therefore, we are providing an additional component by modulating the GLP-1 natural hormone so that it can last longer in circulation and have a more uh, durable effect. So this is actually quite different from the previous uh, mechanisms, uh, mainly because of a direct effect on, um, on the satiety, so how much hunger do we have, but also because it has additional elements in terms of uh, controlling what is the type of food that we are craving for. So tackling a different part of the brain that also signals through the sensations of satisfaction when you eat certain type of foods. And Lars, maybe talk about this moment for the company. Have you ever had a medicine that's had this kind of cultural impact? You know, Ozempic and Wagovi are basically household names at this point. There were jokes at the Oscars uh, about how everybody was taking one of these medicines. Um, Weight Watchers has now gotten into this space because they saw it as a space they had to be in because this is so important to the category of weight loss. 
how how does that cultural moment? Uh, how do you think about that um, as as the company? Have you ever been in a situation <clears throat> like this before with a product? Well, it's important for me to underline that uh, Ozempic is approved for type two diabetes, uh, and Wegovy is approved for uh, obesity and is now uh, launched uh, on, on the U.S. market. But your point about uh, what it actually means for patients is a really, really good point because if you uh, live with obesity, you have typically lived with obesity for a good part of your life, if, if not your whole uh, life. And many have tried all kinds of different attempts to lose weight. And to Karen's point from before, that there's a genetic uh, element for, for most patients. It's really important to acknowledge that this is actually a serious chronic condition to live with. And many of those who uh, reduce energy intake, uh, the body will actually uh, also reduce energy expenditure to maintain what is your, your BMI, so to say. So it's really, really difficult to, to uh, in a sustainable way, uh, lose weight. So now we have these medicines uh, that, uh, in, a, in a good way, is bringing both the weight loss that uh, patients are looking for and bringing it in a sustained manner for a, a quite uh, long uh, period of time. And this brings a lot of hope. And if you have been controlled by, by your hunger, uh, you know, getting your, uh, say, life back and, and actually being able to focus on, on other things is a really, really defining thing for, for one of these uh, patients. So I'm really, uh, I'm really excited about that uh, and what we as a company can bring to patients and empower those patients to live say, a full and rich life and contribute to society. So in my view, this uh, medical intervention is going to want, be one of those that has the biggest, say, benefit for the individual, but also for society compared to what we typically see of, of medical interventions. Mm. And Conan, maybe tell us a little bit about the experience for people taking Wagovi. Let's talk about the weight loss they see um, you have to keep taking the drug in order for the weight to stay off. Is that right? What does the company know about that? And what also do you know about if you're taking this drug, you know, chronically, does your weight keep falling or at some point do you reach a stasis? How does that work? Yes, uh, thank you. So I, I think, again, we need to come back to, to what is that we know in this balance of energy in and energy out. And as Lars was alluding to, the body is trying to fight, right? If you are controlling the amount of food that you have, your your food intake is also going, sorry, your energy intake is always going to change as well as your expenditure. So what we know today, and this is both based on uh, uh, animal pharmacology, as well as the clinical trials, is that you do need to keep taking uh, the medicine because what GLP-1 is doing is, again, still controlling your, um, your satiety, but is not yet, let's say, redefining your neural networks to really define a new body weight set point. And I think this is what we see when people go on diets or different uh, exercise regimens, similar to when they go on pharmacological treatment, that as long as you're keeping your, your intake the same, your output the same, and you're able to control your weight. But if you go uh, out of this, you will immediately start to come back. And for different individuals, this period of stay with your weight loss or your weight stable will be very different. Some will come back earlier, some will come later. But what is critically important is that definitely you need to stay. And this is, again, something that we see both in pharmacology, animal experimentation, as well as clinical uh, data. So quite critical, because we are not yet able to redefine that weight, uh, body weight set point. And that's where the next generation of investigation and, and trials will help us understand much better. Oh, yeah, I would definitely want to ask you about that sort of next generation of medicines as well. But just sticking on this point, what has been observed about, you know, how much weight patients would gain back if and when they stop taking the medicine? Do they gain back all of the weight they lost on average? Do they gain back more? Do they gain back less? I think it's uh, the data that we have, uh, again, varies really depending on the individual, but in about, uh, you know, five years or so, you're about to re recover almost all your weight and maybe in the two, three years, about 50 percent. But this, again, is a very different uh, rate of um, gain depending on the individual. So the, the reality, again, is just to, to stress out that you need to keep controlling your intake and your expenditure. 
and the, the pharmacology that we have today, the pharmacotherapies, are actually helping us do that in a, in a way to control the signals to the brain. So it is important mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to say for one individual today how soon you will be able to come back uh, uh, or how soon your body weight will really go back to the starting point. And in some other instances, some individuals actually go beyond the initial starting point. So again, some of the work that we need to understand what drives the rate of you know, re returning to your original body weight. Mm. And Karen, just sticking with you for a minute, I think one question a lot of people have for a medicine that you would need to take chronically, and I've seen comparisons to statins, for example, you stay on these for long periods of time to maintain lowered cholesterol. Similarly, you know, sticking with Wagovi for long-term weight loss, keeping the weight down. What is known about the long-term safety uh, of taking these medicines for years on end? So right now, the data that we are generating is, you know, two years, three years, I think, is the maximum that we have at the moment. And uh, so far, we can say that the, the drugs are well tolerated. There is no safety uh, that we are aware. Uh, we continue to monitor this. So for the time being, for the duration of data that we have, uh, people maintain uh, their, their weight. You were asking as to how much more do they get. There is a time where you get the plateau. Uh, so I think all uh, things considered right now with the data looks that it's tolerable. The safety profile continues to be favorable as well. And the weight uh, loss is maintained. And still, we need to see how much more with the longer uh, duration of treatment, uh, how much more will people will be able to achieve. But uh, right now, it's about, uh, you know, 20 percent uh, weight loss for about 30 percent of the population on, on the treatment. So quite uh, favorable uh, compared to other uh, treatments in the past. And what are the, some of the, the long-term risks that you're especially looking out for potentially to see? You know, we hear about the risk of pancreatitis or uh, a risk that was seen in animals of a certain type of cancer. What are the sort of things you are looking out for um, for the long-term safety? As I said, I think we continue to monitor the, the individuals that are exposed to the, to the treatment. And uh, so far, the data that we have today does not uh, suggest that there is any concern uh, that we need to worry. Of course, we keep monitoring. Um, so, you know, we, we keep just looking uh, for, for patients and, and that's all. Well, Lars, tell us about the access to these medicines. You know, we know that they were in shortage for a period of time. What does the supply look like now? And what does the reimbursement environment look like where patients are having their insurers actually pay for these drugs for them? Yeah, you, you're right. Uh, when we launched initially, we saw a very, very strong demand, uh, much stronger than we have seen in uh, in, in prior launches. Um, then we uh, ran into some challenges with a contract manufacturer, and they had uh, to uh, halt manufacturing uh, for a period of time. Uh, that meant that we could not support uh, the market with the starter doses, but we kept supplying, say, maintenance, maintenance doses because they came from a different facility. Then uh, we are back uh, in the market. We have, uh, you know, built inventories to be able to, to relaunch. We did that in the beginning of this year. We see a very, very strong uptake. Um, we have two more manufacturing lines uh, being uh, prepared to come in line during this year. Uh, so we're very encouraged to see uh, the, the uptake uh, and uh, we, uh, we keep investing. We have guided for significantly higher uh, CapEx investments, uh, some three and a half uh, billion uh, US uh, dollars uh, on, a, on a yearly basis for, for some years. In terms of uh, access, uh, we uh, have a market structure in the US where it's primarily commercial uh, insurance, uh, so employers uh, opting in for obesity uh, support for their uh, employee base and a couple of, uh, say, government channels. So we can address approximately uh, 40 million uh, people living with obesity in the U.S. out of the, say, 110 million uh, having a BMI of uh, 30 and above, and we will gradually expand that access. So this is actually a, a sizable access compared to also what we know of uh, people living with uh, type 2 diabetes. So it's a similar market we can uh, we can address uh, already at this point of time, and it will keep uh, being expanded expanded in the future. 
Uh, and it's still only, you know, a very small fraction of those who live, maybe two, three percent of those who live with uh, obesity who are actually on on, uh, on treatment today. So there's a lot to focus on in our commercial uh, organization, and uh, and they are having uh, very good uh, traction so far. And one thing I know that Wall Street is watching very closely is uh, a study that's expected to read out, I believe, this summer, looking at the cardiovascular outcomes of uh, using a drug to lower weight. So, you know, we know that using a drug for people who have diabetes can result in uh, lower cardiovascular risk, things like heart attacks. But for people who don't have diabetes and are using the drug for obesity and losing weight, what is the impact then on preventing heart attacks and other cardiovascular risk events? Lars, how how important is that study for Novo Nordisk and potentially securing uh, more reimbursement from insurers? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. We know that uh, Ozempic, uh, the product for type 2 diabetes, and vision, obesity, so, sorry, type 2 diabetes, has uh, proven to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by 26 percent, a very sizable risk reduction. Um, I mentioned that the uptake uh, so far of the uh, obesity product with Gobi is very, very strong. So you can say that uh, the market is taking up, the demand is, is there, even despite the fact that we do not have these uh, CV data for, for Gobi yet. Um, as we look to broaden the market and also look to secure market access reimbursement in, say, European markets, where it's typically a single payer and it's government-funded healthcare, it's important to show that this is actually something that's uh, improving health. It's not just reducing weight for the individual and the benefit that comes from that, but it's also having a, a positive impact on, on, say, overall health resilience. So um, we, we believe it will it'll, uh, be a part of the puzzle in getting broad reimbursement. Uh, but I'll just underline that so far the markets we have launched, we go in, which is only three markets. It's, it's the US, obviously, it's Denmark, Norway, we see very steep uptake in all markets. So for sure, there is a demand even without the CV component. But we think it's important for the longer term build of, say, uh, healthcare uh, system based, uh, reimbursed based uh, access to obesity medicine. Mm. And Cotton, what are the next steps here? I mean, you guys are continuing to test uh, next generation medicines, combinations. What do you see as sort of the next leg forward uh, in this class of medicines uh, in terms of, you know, weight loss, uh, type 2 diabetes, the outcomes you expect to be able to achieve? One thing we've heard from doctors is that it would really be great if the tolerability were improved with these because you can feel some kind of nausea and GI effects from these medicines. What will the next step look like? Yes, uh, Megan, thank you. And uh, first and foremost, uh, coming back to that energy energy balance, it is important to understand that the, the brain regulation of energy uh, intake and output is actually quite complex. So right now we have very good uh, results uh, with the GLP-1-based uh, medicines, but there is room for uh, providing an additional mechanism that will help add uh, more benefit. So at the moment, we are exploring actually a combination with another uh, peptide uh, that brings um, additional components to the satiety uh, element, but also into that reward system that we all uh, have when we eat, again, different types of foods and an additional component, as well as the energy expenditure. So this additional mechanism is based on amylin, and amylin is a, a peptide that is secreted out of the pancreas at the same time of insulin when you have uh, for, for food consumption. This peptide signals as well in the brain, but in slightly different regions where the GLP-1 uh, signals. And by doing this, this is where you are adding uh, uh, additional mechanisms that will work together to deliver much efficacious weight loss and uh, potentially as well, you know, we we'll need to explore if it's going to be more better duration and, and stay down on the, on the weight. So the, at the moment we are exploring this, we have generated another analog that it's also have a longer lasting activity. And we are combining this amylin analog with the GLP-1. Uh, the name is uh, Cagrisema, and uh, we have uh, so far a uh, very interesting data in phase two, where uh, we are achieving about 15 uh, percent weight loss in type 2 diabetes uh, patients. So we are very excited ab about this uh, particular uh, combination. But, you know, the quest in 
identifying better mechanisms for obesity is not over yet. We need to do still much more research in order to understand additional drivers of disease, because, as I alluded to, despite the fact that we are able to achieve very nice uh, uh, weight loss, that sustainability and that weight maintenance, it's quite important. And then, also, we still have room compared to what we can achieve, for example, with bariatric surgery of about 30 percent. So, mechanisms that will help us drive that uh, weight loss further. But beyond weight loss, you were alluding already about cardiovascular protection. We believe that we need to start driving as well for understanding how this weight loss is going to help protect on other comorbidities, cardiovascular disease being one of them. So, exploring mechanisms that will potentially protect additional organs in addition to bringing uh, weight loss to the to the uh, individuals. So, it's quite exciting times, but there is still a lot of uh, work for us to do. And I think it's um, an important time as well, science-wise, because as we are starting to deliver mechanisms that are achieving significant weight loss, there is, there is more excitement in the community not only at the level of uh, uh, universities or investigators, but also at the level of biotech, that uh, there is more interest, because now we can show that this is possible, right, that you can achieve significant weight loss, and then hopefully that the data that has been generated in the past in terms of complication prevention, that this will be solidified and therefore really engage more interest and more innovation will come in this space from Novo Nordis, but from others in the field as well. Mm, really, the beginning of a potential revolution here. And Lars, to end our conversation, I think we'll, we'll go back to where we began, and that's, of course, with the origins of the company and in insulin. You recently announced that you plan to lower the list price of your insulins following a similar move from Eli Lilly. What was the driver for this? There was some reporting that, in addition to the demand from patients and, and lawmakers for there to be lower prices, you actually would avoid a Medicaid penalty by lowering the list price of the drugs. Did that drive the decision? Well, if you follow the history of No Noise, you've seen that we have uh, put different attempts out to uh, make insulin affordable. And uh, this is, uh, say, the next round of those efforts, acknowledging that many patients uh, are struggling because of insurance uh, scheme design. And by this change, we lower the list price is what, is what many patients uh, end up uh, paying. Uh, you, you, you comment on, on other aspects. Uh, I'll just say that the complexity of the U.S. market is one where it takes many, uh, you know, different options to really make insulin affordable for patients. And that's what uh, this is all aimed at.